Uh, so hi everyone, and uh, welcome to another weekly seminar of the Institute of Astrophysics. So uh, it's a great pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Georgios Dimitriades. So a little bit about uh, Georgos. So Georgos did his uh, undergrad in Thessaloniki, as many of us uh, have. Uh, and then he moved to the Netherlands for his master's degree. Uh, in Amsterdam. After that, in between 2013 and 2017, uh, he did his PhD at the University of Southampton uh, with uh, Mark Sullivan. And then when he graduated, he moved to the US uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And then since 2021, he's back in Europe uh, at Trinity College uh, Dublin, where he's uh, currently based. And uh, he's doing exciting stuff about transit astronomy, um, transient astronomy, sorry, um, type 1A supernova. And uh, he's going to talk about um, very exciting and peculiar types of uh, type 1A supernova. So, uh, Jorgo, thanks again for accepting our invitation, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, and thank you very much for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to share uh, work that I have been doing the last years, mainly in the US, uh, but also here, the last months here in, uh, in Dublin. Uh, so currently, this Trinity College is in the center of Dublin, and uh, it's not raining, which is always good. So I, uh, I will talk about... Um, uh, the Super Chandra Sekar Type 1A supernova, which is um, a part of the whole family of thermonuclear supernova, the Type 1A supernovas we call them, and uh, the extreme ones. These are you will see later on. Of course, John asked me if I can give also a brief overview um, about uh, about supernova in general, Type 1A, and then move to Super Chandra. Events, so that's what I'm going to do. So this is basically the outline of my talk. I will talk a little bit about supernova and where we are now, where we were before the last few decades. Then uh, type one A, why we study them, why they are interesting, and uh, what are the problems that we face, the scientific problems. I mean, and then I will move to the subtypes of the super Chandra uh, type one A, which are generally rare, but uh, they are there, and I can talk. Uh, a little bit more in detail in two events. One is uh, 2020 SM, which is published uh, recently, and the object that I'm working now, uh, 2021 ZNY. And then I will conclude. But before that, as always, it's always good to uh, acknowledge some people. So left side is the Kepler, the KEX. So you see the telescope, the spacecraft is jiggling, and there's a story behind this. If we have time in the end, I will tell you. Uh, so while I was in the US, I worked a lot with the KEX team, which was uh, the Kepler Extragalactic Survey. Kepler is a planet hunter, but uh, it can also observe supernova, as we proved. So Armin was uh, the lead on this, Armin Rest, and there are other people listed here uh, who contributed in uh, one, one big paper that I wrote on this. Then in the middle is the Young Supernova Experiment, which I worked a lot during my time in the US. Uh, under the uh, under uh, Professor Ryan Foley, who is the first to thank, and then many other people uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, Dave Jones, who is a postdoc, uh, Matt, who just finished his PhD and he's uh, starting a fellowship, and also um, other people. Yeah, uh, Yorgo, sorry to interrupt you. There seems to be something blocking our view at the uh, uh, right of your screen. There's some sort of wind. Okay, it's gone now. Thank you. Ah, okay, it was there. Yeah, okay. Maybe like this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It happens. Yeah, yeah. It happens sometimes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so, hope now it's okay. So, I will continue uh, with the Young Supernova experiment, exactly as I, as I worked there. This is a big collaboration. It uses the Panstars telescopes, which are, um, uh, you can see it in the middle. And then uh, when I moved here in uh, Trinity, I also started working. I, start, I worked with Kate Maguire, uh, the professor here. There is a, a very nice group here, three PhD students, Maxim, Luke, and Jaco, who are very talented. And uh, we are part of the ZTF, 
uh, we're partners of ZDF and um, we work on uh, we work on the survey mainly of the one a physics part so i would like to acknowledge also people like uh, viraz and uh, mark and uh, all the team basically which are still starting to learn all of them so uh, in a nutshell what supernova uh, have, i will not say what they are but it's also it's always good to go back to history so as you can see around 1900, it was the first extra galactic supernova that we discovered. And then for many years, uh, we were finding basically one or two or three per year, even less, I would argue. But uh, then uh, changes, there, there were changes. The main changes, of course, were technological. So you can see here around the 70s, the first robotic searches and in the 80s, it was the first CCD searches. Which is important because uh, moving to the digital camera uh, made it possible also to improve the technology in, in uh, you know the difference imaging and all of this. So we started to to find much more. And of course, you see the number is is become very big, especially after the 90s, where the accelerating universe was discovered, particularly because of type one A. And actually, if you see if we zoom in on the last decade, it's a little bit older plot. But you can actually see now that, uh, by the way, these are spectroscopically confirmed, I think. Uh, these are different surveys. And one of the big difference, of course, after the 2005, I think, or something like this, was that we started to do untargeted surveys. So before, we're targeting specific galaxies. We had the catalog of galaxies, we targeted them, and we found transient. But after 2005, with SDSS and SNLS, we started to do untargeted surveys. Look across the sky and we found whatever we found. And this was a big thing because uh, we discovered a lot of supernova. Currently, this, the dark energy survey has finished. Uh, we have ZTF and TZ and other surveys that we discovered supernova. And then eventually we will have LSST, which will be millions per, per year probably. And um, it, it will be a game changer in a sense. But uh, what I'm arguing here is that when you find a lot of supernova, you tend to find also, you will find a lot of normal, normal events, but you will obviously find some weirdos. And this is basically what I was, I was mainly working uh, the last few years. So back in 2003, before the targeted, uh, before the untargeted surveys and the thousands of supernova per year, this was basically the picture of the, of the supernova in terms of uh, progenitors and how we type them. So basically you see in the left, it's what we call thermonuclear, which is the type 1A, and on the right is the core collapse. So the, the basic classification comes from a spectrum. And the first thing to see is if there is hydrogen. So if there is hydrogen, this is, we type it as a core collapse supernova type two. And um, uh, if there is no hydrogen, but there is uh, a feature which is at around 6,000, uh, 6,100 angstroms, which is the silicon. This is the type 1A. So for this, as you can see, everything to the left, which is 1A, is the thermonuclear supernova. The right is the core collapse. And the difference basically comes from what is the object that is exploding. So the thermonuclear is a, the white dwarf, is a white dwarf explosion. We'll talk later a little bit about this. And to the right, the core collapse is a massive star. And as we know, these are uh, stars above seven or eight, depending who you ask, uh, solar masses, which they, uh, they basically the envelope collapses towards the core and produce an explosion. The difference is that uh, the thermonuclear explosion is much brighter. And uh, another big difference is that generally for the core collapse supernova, we kind of know the idea why there are differences. And you can see it here, basically the progenitor mass, uh, the star that is exploding, uh, will produce different types of supernova from 2 to P to L, uh, up to 1C, uh, based on the mass. And the mass increases downwards, right? So 1C are supernova that happen from very massive stars. Um, so we know this, and we are happy generally with this. But uh, as you can see here, uh, when new surveys came, we tend to find a lot of weirdos. 
uh, what, everything that you see here, for example, the newest one, it's called 1CN. This is a new type of supernova uh, published and basically the term was coined the last month, I think. Um, but uh, yes, there are a lot. You can see also a picture of the cow. This is the cow, the 2018 cow. I don't know if, many, if people know about this, but this is a very weird object that uh, does not, uh, we cannot explain it very well, but probably it's a core collapse, so I put it there. And uh, of course, the same thing, kind of, the same thing happens in the, in the thermonuclear supernova, where again, we know that they look similar, but there are differences. And this is what I will, uh, I will present later, and I will talk a little bit more about one of them, which is the Super Chandra type one name. So this is text. Uh, we try not to have a lot of text, but basically the general properties of 1A is that they look the same, all of them. So there is a uniformity in the photometric and spectroscopic characteristics. I list some of them. Uh, the important thing is that the light carriers are generally the same. They all peak generally at minus 19 mark, and then the evolution is generally similar. As we said, in terms of the spectra, the strong feature at 6,150 is, is silicon, and we don't see hydrogen or helium. Generally, this is an optical phenomenon, a near infrared, so we don't see UV and radio and X-rays and all of this. And one important thing, of course, is that they explode both at early and late type galaxies. And actually, this was the first time uh, that people thought that the, this must be a white dwarf because it's an old stellar object that explodes since we see that early type uh, galaxies. And the basic idea for how this explosion happens was uh, in the past was um, the, the idea that basically you have a white dwarf and we have the Chandra second mass limit, which everyone knows and everyone should know by now, which is the upper mass limit for a degenerate matter of a non-rotating degenerate matter of carbon and oxygen. So as the uh, white dwarf reaches, it does not surpass it, but as it reaches this mass, then we have a thermonuclear runaway. But uh, I think what is happening now is that, okay, generally they are uniform, but they vary sometimes slightly, sometimes less slightly, but uh, generally the, the, there is an intrinsic var variation, which uh, we're trying to find out. And this is what it looks like. So this is a plot for the Supernova Handbook in 2017 from Stefan Taubenberger. And here is a plot that you see on the y-axis is the, um, the absolute magnitude at peak in B band. And uh, in the x-axis is the a parameter which we call delta M15, which is basically the drop in magnitude from peak and 50 days after peak in B band. And uh, this basically is a measure of how slow or fast is a light curve in the s-axis and how bright and faint. And uh, the first thing that you will see here is the gray crosses, which are the sample of normal 1A supernova, and the straight line. This is the Phillips relation, which is a very strong correlation that basically says that uh, supernova, 1A supernova, which they are bright, they're also slow, and the ones that are faint, uh, they are fast. And uh, this is basically the base of cosmology. I will have a slide later about this. But uh, all the other colorful uh, points and uh, regions are regions in space of, uh, in this parameter space, that we believe that these objects are, have thermonuclear origin, there is arguments why, uh, but they kind of don't conform the normal Phillips relation. Some are bright, too bright for the decline rate, some are very faint, some are very fast. And of course, apart from the photometric properties, which we saw here, there's also spectroscopic peculiarities, which we can, uh, we can look a little bit later, especially for the, for the Super Chandra. So one thing, of course, to note is that there are some gaps in this plot. Uh, these gaps can be real. It can be also uh, some bias, observational bias. So possibly, uh, you guys, what you uh, you will build in uh, Skinakas, uh, you can fill gaps of um, very fast transients, maybe, of thermonuclear. Who knows? Uh, hopefully, this will go on and uh, will be built, and uh, it will be amazing, obviously. But generally, if we focus on, on the normal ONAs, st still we see a variation. And on the left, you see light curves. 
So the blue light curves are the brighter ones and uh, the red are the fainter ones. In the Middle East spectra, so the blue spectrum corresponds uh, to, to bright type 1A, the red to fainter, and the black is the normal, right? It's, it's a normal 1A. On the right is the host galaxies. Now, it's not a good plot, but um, I hope that you will believe me that basically what happens is this. So these correlations that we see, even in the normal 1A, is that the bright supernova are slow and they are also blue at peak. So the B minus V color, for example. Um, so we call this brighter, broader, bluer. There is also some uh, indication of a uh, correlation in, uh, in the spectra. So the ones that they are brighter, they also have higher photometric, photospheric temperature. And you can see, for example, in the bottom plot of the spectrum, uh, this is work from one of our PhD students in, uh, in the US, where uh, you basically see uh, what, what you see above, that uh, the ones that with delta M15 low, so bright ones, uh, the ratio between these two silicon lines is uh, smaller. Uh, and this is basically because uh, uh, of the photospheric temperature. This is an effect of the, of the temperature at the ejecta in the photosphere. Uh, of course, the other things about the host galaxies, the ones that they are bluer, so brighter and broader, they tend to explode in late type galaxies, while the other ones, they tend to explode in, in early. Uh, the reason behind this is unclear. The fact of the, of the bright light curve and the, the faint light curve probably has to do with the nickel mass, the nickel 56, which is produced, synthesized in the explosion. And it's the main power source of the light curve. So the light curve that we see basically is because of the uh, nickel 56 decay. So you can uh, naively say that, OK, if I have if the explosion produced a lot of nickel, then it will be brighter. There is also some, some indication that the ejecta, so the ejecta is the total mass of the white dwarf that it's exploding, play a part there. But still, it's not super clear. Uh, but we keep at least the nickel 56, which is the main, the main power source for the light curve. In any case, still, as I say here, the variations are, are generally small. And using the empirical correlations that I showed before, we can do the standardization. So type 1A, we call them standard, actually standardizable candles. And from these, we can measure distances and use them in uh, extragalactic distances uh, very far away. And we can use them in cosmology studies that basically led to the remarkable um, discovery of the accelerated expansion. So for example, here on the left is a Hubble diagram. Uh, this was a state of the art in 2014 which combined many surveys uh, from many supernova from many surveys up to Redshift almost one. And on the right is the recent work we have done, uh, not me, but you know, uh, the people uh, we collaborate with, which is, uh, this is the distance ladder. So basically this describes how we measure the distances and we calibrate supernova, which are on bottom, uh, top right, down to CFIDs uh, in the middle and uh, the CFID distances and the uh, geometrical uh, distances. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done also in cosmology. There you, I, hope, I, I guess you know about the H0 tension, which is basically the H0, the Hubble constant we measure from supernova, is different from the one we measure from the CMB. And this is not clear, still not clear. Uh, and of course, there is some other uh, open question in cosmology, mainly the, uh, if dark energy evolves with redshift. But uh, for me, at least, this is not super interesting, but it's not my, uh, what I do for a living. What I, I like to do most is to figure out what is happening with these two supernova remnants in general, right, in type 1A. So I'm interested about the physics and the progenitor and the explosion mechanism. And this is a, a picture that I always saw, which I like a lot. Uh, these are two supernova remnants of historical supernova, which we, we are pretty sure this is type 1A. And uh, on the left, it's the Kepler supernova. On the right, it's Tycho. And as you can see, they look similar. They are both somehow symmetric. They are spherical, like a circle. But uh, there is some small scale um, uh, differences. And this means that we don't know. We, I mean, the explosion, it, it's probably not a viewing effect. This is the real. So 
uh, what's the deal there? If supernova 1A are, are, no, are uniform, someone might naively think that, okay, the explosion mechanism, the progenitor model is the same. But uh, this picture may, may, may tell you, the, the plots that I saw here, the picture may tell you that this, this is not the case. So this is what I find interesting, and this is basically what I'm trying to work. Uh, one thing is the explosion mechanism, and here is some small text. Uh, basically, the, the thing is that in order to find the correct, or at least an explosion mechanism that can explain 1A, it, can definitely, it should definitely explain the nucleosynthesis, so the, the composition of the ejecta, and uh, agree, of course, the spectra and the likers. Uh, the explosion me mechanism should be robust, but it also should account for the intrinsic variability that we see, at least for the normal 1A variability that we see. And of course, the explosion mechanisms mechanism correlate with the actual progenitor system. So the binary configuration, or if it's not a binary, anything that we consider as, as the, the progenitor system. And this is basically a, a very general and simplistic approach of the, on the problem, on the progenitor problem. And um, so we know that the, the explosion is a wide bar, uh, the exploding object, I'm sorry, it's a wide bar. But what we don't know is what is the nature of the companion that provides either the extra mass for the object to, uh, to explode or provides the circumstances, the properties while they merge in case of the double degenerate um, in order to, to explode. So on the left is a double degenerate scenario. This comes, this is a moniker uh, due to the fact that we have two white dwarfs, two degenerate objects, that basically they come together as they, uh, as they lose angular momentum uh, because of gravitational waves actually, and they merge. Uh, I say here violently, but it doesn't need to be violent, but uh, generally they merge and they ignite the carbon fusion in order for, for the object, the primary white dwarf to explode. And of course, there are variations of this, um, uh, which we may talk a little bit later. Uh, and the next uh, scenario, which was actually the, the one we believed much uh, during the previous decades, is the single degenerate scenario, which has an easier explosion mechanism. It's simply a wide bar that accretes mass from a star, from a normal star. So you have one degenerate object. And um, as the wide dwarf reaches the Chandra Sekar match, then boom, that's basically the idea. And of course, there are variations in this, um, in this scenario too. Now, the current state is probably this. So uh, the double degenerate scenario, or at least the absence of a companion star is probably favored. I will show you some stuff later about this. But uh, we think that probably some kind of single degenerate scenario happens, but probably there. But uh, I have to note here that there is uh, some new approaches, especially the, some sudden sub secar scenarios, especially the double detonation, which um, uh, coincidentally, it, it can happen both with a helium star companion and the helium wide dwarf companion, actually. So it's basically somewhere in between, in the middle, which is uh, very attractive. It's very, very good. And there are, I, I would argue, there are uh, uh, direct evidence of it. Uh, but generally, the picture is this. So I'm going to move here and to show you why we believe that the double degenerate scenario is probably the correct for, for most of the 1As, let's say, the general population. And this happened because of a supernova specifically. And this is uh, the famous supernova 11FE. You see on the uh, top left, the, uh, the video of the, uh, based on PTF. So this was discovered by PTF. It is the second most uh, uh, close uh, close by supernova of the modern era. The first was 14J, but it was not useful for, uh, for observations. So uh, 11FE also was discovered 11 hours after explosion, which is incredible. And it's still ob observable, uh, maybe not now, but at least for six years, we could, we could observe it. So the amount of data is humongous. I also worked during my PhD on this. And we learned a lot about this. And the first thing that we learned is, I think it is the direct evidence of the exploding object being a white bar because of a very early spectrum. 
uh, that uh, places a, a very tight constraint of the radius of the exploding object. And this is basically the red dot that you see here. Um, it places around 0.1 solar mass, which is consistent with the white bar. So we have probably the direct evidence, the most direct that you can get uh, for a white dwarf explosion. The second thing that we learned was that with three explosion images, and you see on the top, uh, the galaxy was targeted with HST many times because it is nearby. And uh, we find that there is no luminous, at least um, red Zion or helium star as a companion. And basically the limit is the yellow line that you see in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, it could be a, a main sequence star or a secondary dwarf, uh, secondary white dwarf. The next thing, that we learned is that uh, we didn't see any X-rays and radio. This we expected, as we said, the phenomenon is basically optical and near infrared. But for the case of the single degenerate scenario, you could expect X-rays or radio due to interaction of the ejecta, ejecta are the ashes as they as they expand after the explosion. Uh, we this interaction should should produce X-rays or radio, but we haven't seen anything for 11FE. And the other thing um, that we also see is with spectropolarimetry, we can probe the symmetry of the object. And we found that it's symmetric, which is kind of new, but this is always good uh, to check. In terms of the explosion mechanism and the theory, there are conflicting results. Uh, I here list uh, Robke, but um, there are indications that both single degenerate scenarios and double degenerate scenarios can generally explain 11 fe but I will argue that probably the double degenerate, some form of merger is, uh, is a little bit better. This is on the right hand side, the spectra is the, um, for the violent merger scenario. Uh, so 11 fe told us that probably, and because 11 fe was a very normal supernova, extremely normal, uh, we can say that, okay, this, this, the double degenerate scenarios are probably the correct ones. However, as I, as I said before, Sometimes we see indications of a companion. And the most famous uh, subtype uh, for this is the 1ACSM. Uh, this is a type 1A supernova that they saw hydrogen. So it's uh, a little bit uh, uh, difficult to, to, to think about this because by definition, we say that type 1As are, do not contain any hydrogen at all. Uh, but sometimes they do, uh, as, I, as I told you before. And basically, uh, these objects are brighter than the normal 1A. And this is due to the interaction with some material, hydrogen material in this case, around the explosion, uh, around the explosion object. Uh, these are rare, extremely rare events. Actually, they're too rare, I think. Uh, but the thing is that sometimes, if you have a lot of mass, in the CSM, CSM stands for circumstellar medium, so the material around the explosion. Uh, if you have a lot of CSM, this can obscure the, the signatures of the type 1A. And uh, so maybe there are objects there that they are, they have thermonuclear origin, but we, just, we think that they are like core collapse uh, because of the strong suppression of the, of the features of the 1A. Uh, and here basically you see in the middle is uh, the paper from Dilde from 2012 when they have the idea about the progenitor system. The supernova happens in the middle and the companion before, due to some nova eruptions potentially or some wind, some material was lost. There is an outflow of material that remains at 10 to the 16 centimeters or something like this. And then as the supernova explodes, uh, uh, the material, uh, the ejecta interact with this. And uh, the fact that uh, these are, um, we see these, and especially the calcium lines that you see in the spectra of uh, 11KX, but also the sodium lines, which are not visible here, but um, these lines are generally blue shifted, which indicate outflows. And uh, Sternberg in 2011 has showed that for samples of 1A with um, high resolution spectroscopy, the lines of sodium specifically, which basically track um, the, the gas and the dust around at the line of sight of the supernova, these are generally tend to be blue shifted. 
So this has been attributed as an argument in favor of a single degenerate scenario because the companion star should have outflows, material going outwards, while if you have a double degenerate, it's a clean environment. There is nothing around it. Um, there are some recent developments in towards the, the let's say the single degenerate objects. One is uh, the bumps. So sometimes supernova show an early flux excess, which I will show you later about a specific one. Uh, sometimes uh, very rare events, right? Uh, there is a very high UV um, brightness at very late times, which may con be considered again as interaction of the ejecta with material. And also sometimes we see uh, narrow hydrogen lines in late time observations of 1A, uh, which they, they look normal 1A, but and so not like 1A CSN, they look normal around peak. But uh, afterwards, you, you see this, these narrow hydrogen lines. So I will focus uh, uh, shamelessly on uh, my work on uh, one of the peculiar objects. Uh, peculiar in a sense that uh, it shows a very prominent flux excess at early times. So this was a Kepler um, observation, so Planet Hunter. And you see actually the, the video on the bottom left is uh, basically the supernova as it explodes. And uh, this was a normal type 1A at peak. But as you can see in the middle, there is very uh, clear and blue, actually. I don't have the color. Ah, yeah, the colors are in the bottom. A very blue early color during the flux axis, which we attributed back then to a collision between the ejecta and the companion. At the same time, this, uh, which, which is basically a single degenerate um, scenario. But the, the idea is that as the supernova uh, collides with the companion, it should strip some material from the companion, mainly hydrogen and helium. And then at very late times, you will see this material as, a, as an emission line in the spectra. And for this object, we haven't seen it. Or at least we put, we put a limit, we put a constraint on the amount of hydrogen. But uh, indeed, uh, these are things that uh, in the future we will have much more. We recently finished a study with ZTF about uh, bumpy objects and try to estimate a rate or at least a percentage of how many objects we find. And uh, things are going well. Uh, we believe that around 5 to 10% of normal 1As should show these bumps. And now the next step for this, of course, is to connect this with the progenitor mechanism. This is work uh, that one of our PhD students is doing here. I will move now to the Super Sandra because as you see in the plot, these are kind of connected, it seems. So in the plot, you see the black points are the one ACSM, which as I said, they are bright and blue points are the, the Super Sandra um, a type 1a, the population, a part of it, a sample. As you see, they cover the same um, area in terms of, of the absolute um, brightness, but they are a little bit faster. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, the actual delta M15 is similar to the bright normal 1a's, but generally are brighter than them. So basically what happens is that these objects appear to be brighter than the expected decline rate. Of course, as you see here, there is also a lot of diversity within them. And this is um, mainly we see two of the supernova, which I will spend a few uh, on them individually. But basically, in a nutshell, Super Chandra events are very bright, extremely bright. It's, it can be minus 20, minus 20.5. Uh, and the light curve evolution is, is slow. And if you combine the fact that they are very bright at peak, and the light curve is slow, and you use our next rule, which we use all the time to estimate a nickel mass and the total mass, the ejecta mass, we find that it is more than the Chandra Sekar limit. That's why we have this moniker called uh, Super Chandra. Another important thing is that they have blue colors uh, before peak, and I will show you some comparisons later. And uh, the other thing is that there is, as I say here, there is no secondary maxima in the near infrared bands. I don't remember if I had a plot of an R light curve, but uh, in normal 1As, there are two peaks, let's say one main peak and then a secondary peak. 
uh, in super Sandra, we don't see the secondary maximum. Uh, in terms of spectra, which we can see below, this is uh, from a paper from ASAL, which is probably the first uh, statistical, uh, but not, not complete, but statistical uh, sample of uh, super Chandra events. Generally, they are dominated by, um, actually, this is wrong. It's not intermediate mass elements. Mainly, the intermediate mass elements are very weak. Uh, and the ejecta velocities are very low, which means, if you think about it, the ejecta velocity is low means small kinetic energy. And for a given uh, ejecta mass, this means high, high nickel mass. Uh, another important thing is that they show a lot of unburned material. And unburned material is basically material that has not been um, uh, the wave, the, the shock wave has not reached uh, this material of the carbon oxygen white work. So this is basically carbon and oxygen. Of course, carbon is a better indicator of unburned material uh, because oxygen is synthesized also in the explosion. So whenever you see, for example, at around uh, next to the silicon feature, I uh, hope you can see my pointer here. This is carbon uh, or here, this is very strong. Uh, this is when uh, uh, this probes unburned material. So basically the white dwarf that explodes, the, the wave does not reach the surface if it starts from the center, which is uh, something normal to think. Uh, another important thing is that at the nebular phase, so when the ejecta have become optically thin, uh, and we tend to see uh, the spectrum changes for a pseudo continuum, uh, pseudo black body, like continuum to lines, uh, this is the nebular phase. We see some enhanced fading in the optical bands. And I will, I will show you later a little bit about this. And in terms of the hosts, the important thing is that they generally prefer low mass galaxies. Uh, and if they are in higher mass, they tend to be remote locations. So this means that generally they explode in low metallicity environments that any explosion uh, mechanism and progenitor scenarios take into account of this. Um, and uh, if we go now to, to, to what, what these objects are, from how they come from, the initial guess back in the early days was that this was basically a rapidly rotating white dwarf. So you can imagine that you have one white dwarf that, of course, it increases its mass from a companion, but uh, because it is rotating, uh, the centrifugal force pushes outwards. So even if it has, let's say, 1.5 total mass, it does not explode because the, the conditions to, for the explosion to happen are, are not met. Uh, but uh, after this suggestion, there were uh, very detailed uh, simulations that showed that uh, while this op these things may happen, nature, the, the spectra and the synthetic light curves do not, the theoretical ones, do not look like the super Chandra that we have seen. Specifically, the ejecta velocities, they find generally higher ejecta velocities. So the next um, thing that you can think as a progenitor is that, okay, maybe the light curve is not powered by, uh, simply by the nickel that decays, but maybe it's a normal supernova but you have on top some time of, of, of interaction, basically some time of material around it, which should not be hydrogen. And the interaction of this material, um, the interaction between the ejecta and this material just gives the extra power source for the light curve to be bright. Of course, you still need to have high ejecta mass in total because the light curve is very broad. So maybe a merger, Two, two white dwarfs could be one solution. But uh, the problem with all of this is that these objects are very, very rare. So if you see the paper from Chris Assal, there are, I think, like 10 or 15 that have been discovered and at least uh, observed very well and in detail. But hopefully, um, with uh, current surveys and future, we will find more, more of them and um, we will figure out what is happening there. So after that, I want to talk briefly about two of the supernova uh, of Super Chandra. They were very well observed. 
I want to show here before that 2009 DC is a very bright and slower evolving, while 12 dn, the red one uh, in the plot, is um, is faint. It's almost the, the brightness is more or less the same as a normal 1a, and uh, it declines faster. But these are considered super Chandra, which is just a Monica for now. So I will show you here, this is light curves of uh, 2009 DC. And what I want you to note is that, let me try this. Yeah, so the important thing is that, so th this is the light curve, for example, B bound. And you can imagine that if you draw a straight line, which is what we expect from the cobalt decay, which uh, dominates at, the, at later times, we expect them to, 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 to basically go straight like this. But here is the, what we call the enhanced fading. And you can see it also in the other bands, especially in the BNB. And of course, in U band, it's unobservable. The one thing that, oops, I'm sorry. I wanted also to show, oh, shit. Yeah, forget it. I wanted to show you also the colors. So the dust line here is the U minus B color of a normal 1A. But while here you see for, for 2090C, it's extremely blue. And actually, you can see it in the spectra. So this is the spectral series of 2090C. It was discovered and classified very quickly at minus 10 days. And as you see, it's, it's very blue. I have plots later to compare with normal 1As, and you will see it there also. But what is striking is that you see here this W shape. This one the, to the left is the silicon, and uh, which we see in normal 1As. And on the right, this is the carbon. And as you see, as you go towards peak, this becomes weaker. The next was 2012 DN, similar object in a sense that it was observed with very high cadence. The spectra are excellent. Of course, here again, this is the silicon here. You don't see the carbon, it's much weaker. Also, it was fainter and declined a little faster. But we see again this late time uh, decrease in brightness compared to the normal. And actually, if you, if you see it a little bit better here, for example, in the B-band, it seems that even from 80 days, the brightness in the optical part goes down. So this is an important thing uh, because we believe there are many suggestions of this, specifically for 12DN, at the same time that the optical light curve goes down, uh, there is indication that the near infrared light curves become brighter. This is a, almost a direct evidence of some dust formation, which we generally don't see in type 1As, but some progenitor models account for this. Another idea is that uh, if we think about the interaction, as I was saying before, OK, uh, you have the, uh, the brightness of this object. And then at somewhere here, the interaction stops, basically, because the ejecta had overcome the material that was around it. And then um, they become fainter because there's, there's no interaction here. Uh, this is a, a very difficult thing to prove. And um, especially in the late times, because these objects tend to become extremely faint, right? Again, here you see the straight line is a, a normal 1A. This is the cobalt decay, what we would expect. And 2090C, you see as it starts to drop, and the same thing for 12DN, it's, it's even fainter. Um, and we, we, we were trying to find out why, why this is happening. Uh, another important thing is that for the 12DN spectrum, at this here, at around 6,500, uh, these lines are from the host. So this is not from the supernova, but we see this line here, which it has been attributed as oxygen, which is probably a direct evidence of a merger because you expect at least theoretical models of mergers um, predict uh, for oxygen to appear in late times. Uh, but we don't always see this. It seems that 12DN was, was probably a weirdo, but uh, we want to find more of them. And that's the plan. Uh, this is basically uh, the models that I said about uh, the two competing models. On the left is the merger where uh, basically, uh, the material around it, the CSM material, 
which is hydrogen free, is the secondary white dwarf. So you can imagine a situation where as the secondary uh, is disrupted, it falls to the primary, but some material just leaves the system, it remains close to the system, but outwards. And when the explosion happens, then this interacts, the ejector interact with this material. The second approach is what uh, we call the core degenerate scenario, which basically the idea is you have an AGB star. Uh, basically, you start with two stars. One of the stars becomes a white dwarf. The other one starts to become an AGB. It expands. The white dwarf enters uh, and uh, be, be, uh, starts a common envelope phase between the core of the AGB star, so white dwarf and the core of the AGB star. These are merged somehow, and they explode. And the material that provides the CSM that it is outside of the explosion is basically the envelope of the AGB star, which if it is during the end stages of the evolution, most of the hydrogen would be gone, or at least it would be very far away. And this CSM would be carbon and oxygen. Uh, both have caveats, both have successes, uh, and we plan to, to basically uh, try to find for individual objects which one is correct. And the first object that I will talk is my work now is uh, 2020 SM, uh, which uh, you see it in the middle. In the middle is a big explosion image, and the zoom is actually the supernova that exploded. This was, um, uh, as we see, the galaxy. It's uh, relatively small, and also the supernova happened in a quite a remote location. And this is very good because we don't have to deal with extinction from the host. So extinction from our galaxy, we know it. Uh, if it is far away, we can generally ignore it, and that's the case for it. Um, we had uh, excellent light curves in the optical. Um, from uh, minus 12 to 100 days, and then HST images, which you see on the uh, top right at uh, around 300 days. Uh, we also got UV data because, as we said, these objects are very blue, so we expect them to be bright in, in the UV. Uh, but because it was a COVID supernova, meaning that it was discovered and followed during COVID, uh, we didn't have access to very big telescopes because they were closed. So the spectral sequence is not super good, but still are, are good, and we can do a lot of stuff with it. And basically, this is what it looks like. The light curve is on the left. Uh, gray uh, arrows are the spectra, so we could do better, but still, um, I think it's OK. Uh, so the supernova peaked at around, I, I haven't written it here, but it peaked at around mi minus 19.5, I think, so it is less bright than 2009 BC, but still still bright. There is the absence of the secondary maximum, which for normal one A's, you expect them to be here. We will see later. Um, another thing is that uh, the, here the axis is broken, but here, for example, is that the dust line is the expected decay. And as you see, the observations are much fainter than that. So we still see for this object the enhanced late time decay. And on the spectra, uh, you see here the W, as I showed you before. So this is silicon in the left, carbon in the right. Uh, it generally matches the super chandra events that we know. But the most important thing, in my opinion, I'm ah, sorry, yeah, I will show you here. This is just absolute light curves on the left. So for example, in G band peaked at around, yeah, it's even brighter, around minus 20. And uh, on the right, it colors. So for example, uh, you can see here the U minus G color, how uh, blue it is compared to the green circles, which is a normal, the normal 11 FE. Also here, you can kind of see, for instance, in the I band, this is 11 FE, the normal 1A and the secondary maximums, as it happens here, what we generally don't see them in the super chandra. But I think, in my opinion, the most interesting part for this supernova is this, and specifically the very early spectrum that we got. This was at minus 12 days. And here I compare with different types of supernova. Uh, on the bottom is 11 FE, the green one. So you see these very deep absorption features, which they are mainly 
due to intermediate mass elements. And some of them are labeled, so silicon is here, cal uh, calcium, etc. cetera. Uh, the blue and red is 2009DC and 12DN. And this is a, a type two, a normal type two supernova. And this is a super luminous supernova, which I will go, I will talk a little bit about more. So this is our object, 20SM. As you can see here, you see a very deep line, which could be mistaken. And this is what happened initially for this. It was mistaken instead of a, an absorption feature as a broad P signi H alpha here. But so it was initially this object was classified as a core collapse. But eventually that was that was not the case because it evolved as a normal 1A. So the other thing is uh, this could be maybe silicon, but apparently it's not because the silicon later on appears, blue word from this. So what we think is that this spectrum is a direct evidence of a pure carbon oxygen atmosphere. And the reason is that there are some wiggles in the blue here, but uh, I don't have the plot, but if you see the plot, the plot, we can probably, or to a reasonable amount, we can uh, model them as, as oxygen, just more or less in what you see in superluminous spectra. So in my opinion, this is a direct evidence of a merger uh, because these kind of spectra are expected mainly from mergers. Uh, simply this is, we see basically the pristine material of an explosion of a, of a supernova. And this was, a, this is amazing, this is incredible. Uh, I will move, this is the bolometric liker. Our final estimates for their object is an ejecta of 1.75 and the nickel mass produced around 1.2. Uh, here I want to show you again, this is the late time bolometric liker, again, fainter than what we would expect from a normal decay. And when we go to models, I use the models from Raskin uh, as a comparison. Um, I will, I will not spend a lot of time because I maybe I'm running out of time. So, let me check. Yes, I am. So um, you can uh, look at it in the paper where we can discuss a little bit later about this. But for this object, we prefer the merger. I will quickly go to the new object that we do. We study, this is a work in progress. Uh, same thing, this is a little bit uh, closer on the previous one. Again, very good likers, very good spectra. We also had near infrared, but the good thing is that we had a TESS liker. So TESS is the successor of Kepler. So we would expect to see a photometry, a liker like the Kepler. And um, here is just the, the likers and uh, the spectra that we have. Actually, there are more spectra now, uh, but uh, I want to point this. The supernova was discovered nominally around here, but when we looked at a uh, force photometry of earlier, we found that it is also observed here. And actually what we see here is a small bump. And uh, this is um, incredible in my opinion. Uh, the gray lines here is the test like curve. Of course, it is not as good as Kepler because it is a little bit further away, but the test like curve indicates a flux excess here at the beginning that coincides with our detections of this bump also with ZEF. Also this bump is blue. You can see it the Z minus R compared to 11 FE, which should go like this. And uh, our job is basically to do something like this. So this is the models that I showed before with Noe Bauer. This is a, a very first draft, a very a quick thing that I have done for now. And uh, the bolometric like is the points and the bare explosion without CSM is the red and the blue is with CSM, specifically 0.6 solar masses. We go pretty well here. I'm kind of happy. This one is not good, but generally fixable because you can just increase the opacity of the CSM and the light curve will, will just be brighter here. What we don't go very well is at the bump, which is here. It needs some work, but uh, I know what I have done. Uh, basically here, I assume that the flux in the U-band is zero, which is wrong. Uh, and that will do some, uh, some work on this. Um, I know what I need to do. I will do it probably when we finish the, the talk. So this is basically my conclusions. I will leave it there. 
Uh, I will say quickly thank you. And this is a picture of, um, of Trinity. And I will go back to conclusions and uh, stop uh, for any questions um, from, from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joris. Uh, that was a very clear and interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, I let me see if I can. Um, I don't think I see you. Okay, Vasilis has a question. Um, yeah. Please go ahead, Vasilis. Uh, Yorgo, very interesting talk. And you know, for someone who's not uh, in the domain, I was a bit wondering about the discussion about the progenitor, right? The only thing I know is what we teach in the yeah. physics class, right? So uh, the argument is that uh, uh, some of the progenitors may be white dwarfs merging, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and is this uh, consistent with the fact that the brightness is uh, the luminosity that you get from the thermonuclear explosion is pretty much constant, given the fact that uh, you have a mass size distribution of the white dwarf uh, of the binary system, right? So if both Absolutely. of them explode, how do you ensure that you get the same uh, light? In the end? You mean you mean both of them explode in the merger? In the merger, when you have the merger, is it that both of them will uh, no. will go over Chandra and they will? Uh... No, no, actually. Uh, if you are interested. And I can probably. So it's not a thermonuclear explosion of no. the whole mass. So because I knew that you may say this is from an older talk, and I will say this quickly how you explode the white dwarf, right? So basically, the white dwarfs are somewhere here, right? And what you need to do is to ignite carbon. So there are two ways to do this. One way is increase the density, right? And this is basically what with a single degenerate is happening. So you increase the density and the carbon fusion, which is this, this line here, you reach it and then go boom, right? And this is, a, as I said, this is, a, this is the single degenerate. Um, so you increase the mass, so you increase the density and goes boom, right? The second- but, one, uh, before, before you proceed though, just in the single case, the yeah. amount of material that will ignite is uh, gonna be, pretty much constant in order yeah. to ensure that that's the thing, right? So you assume that the, the progenitor- Exactly. The same so, chemical structure or whatever, right? The same core that will go through, or is it all the mass? It's not it all the mass. That... Yes, so in terms of the, so yeah, in, in this, in the single degenerate models, there is an assumption that the explosion has a fixed ejecta mass, which is the mass of the white dwarf, 1.4, basically. Right. Now, the difference between light curves and composition may be attributed to how much nickel is produced or when the ignition, where the ignition is. Is it in the center? Is it a little bit of center? And so on and so forth. Okay. So this is how we can kind of understand the diversity that we see. There are problems with the single degenerate, which I can tell you later. But I will move quickly to how you explode a double degenerate scenario. And the second, Thing that you can do is to increase the temperature of the white dwarf. So basically increase on the y-axis now to carbon. And how you can do that, basically you slam another white dwarf. It's like hitting it, uh, the white dwarf with a hammer with another white dwarf. And when you do that, you, you basically explode. This is the basic idea of how the explosion happens. Of course, it's much more complicated, but uh, this no, is- I, know. I, no, I, I understand. I was just wondering how all this I mean, if we use them as standard candles, you cannot have very much variation in the luminosity of the source, right? Um, so how do you ensure that it's always the same amount of light that is produced or the same fuel? So I will, that's the thing. It is a, I think it's a, a embarrassing that we use this, op not, I'm not saying it's embarrassing, it's in the community, right? That we use, Type 1A is a standard candle as well. We don't know exactly. The fact is that they are, right? Uh, and they are they, they are very well behaved. And the reason why they are not standard and they are standardizable, it's not clear. But in terms of the physics, I agree. It's an open problem. 
Uh, as I said, most of the times you can kind, at least for the normal supernova, normal one A's. Uh, if you just play around with the nickel mass, you can probably explain the diversity. Uh, and then basically the empirical correlations that, you, that we employ to standardize, the, the, the core of them is probably the nickel mass, let's say. So, so you, you know, there is a Phillips relation. You can imagine the Phillips relation where one parameter is the nickel mass, but we, we don't know. I see another, okay. Yeah, so I was going to say that, uh, I mean, you don't actually need them to all, need all of them to be at the same luminosity, right? So you just uh, use the duration. So there's the standard uh, relation between how long they last and how bright they become, right? So you, you just uh, use the duration basically to infer the luminosity. Um, okay, so Alexandros has uh, his hand raised, so please go ahead. So Alekos was, uh, I didn't say this, but we were together in Amsterdam in Utrecht and he was a PhD when I was doing my master and he's the person that started uh, it got me interested let's say at least and I'm very happy that he's here okay nice yeah hi Yorgos I'm also very happy and proud to, <laughs> to hear yeah. it was the first time that I was explaining to you what is a type 1a yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I can admire you uh, to do all of this very interesting uh, stuff uh, and the, your talk was great so now you I, I was receiving thousands of questions from you when you were a student now I have to ask you one okay go for it yeah so uh, I want to focus on the, the two scenarios the one that you said to explain the super the super Chandra supernova the one is the merger and the other one is the core uh, degenerate and if I understood correctly correct uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, in the one case, the, the CSM is actually the, um, the ejected material from the HB star, mm -hmm. while in the first case, the CSM is actually the remnant of the disrupted uh, secondary white dwarf. Exactly, yeah. So if, according to, 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 to my knowledge, uh, there should be a, a huge difference between these two scenarios in terms of the geometry of the CSM. So the one, yeah, the one should be in the order of, I don't know, astronomical units and the other one of parsec. So it's the way to, 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 to make a, distinct, a distinction uh, based on this fact. Uh, absolutely. I mentioned Kavitz. This is one. Uh, so the way to do it is with polarimetry, right? Uh, generally, the mergers predict an asymmetric uh, explosion, while the AGB predicts a symmetric. Uh, of course, the asymmetry would, would manifest mainly at very early times because in the case of the mergers, the secondary white dwarf, the material is relatively close, which introduces extra problems on this. But um, yeah, I would argue that the best way to prove the merger is with, uh, of course, with an early spectrum as we got and uh, polar polarimetry uh, early times. For the core degenerate scenario, the problem is that I cannot, I cannot think of a case where you will not see any hydrogen at all in the spectra. The argument for uh, people who support this is that this is the end stage of the HB star. So most of the hydrogen has been burned and so on. But this, uh, I don't believe this uh, because I, I think that uh, if that's the case and Super Chandra are just the rare events of uh, an HB star only at the end stage, then we should see a lot of supernova with hydrogen, just because you, you will see them, it's there. Um, in any case, uh, I think that uh, for the last object that I showed with a small bump, um, we should, I mean, we cannot have a spectrum because we didn't know that this happened back then, but uh, if we had a spectrum, things would be much better, but uh, we work on this. Uh, next time we will try harder. Yeah, good luck with that, and uh, yeah. thank you, and thank you for the uh, for the very nice talk. Cheers, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Alexandros. So, just a comment uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, we can, I suggest, because the, the talk is recorded, uh, I suggest that uh, if the speaker is available, we'll continue the Q and A 
session and then for those that have to to leave then they can uh go back to the recorded uh, talk and then check the, the, the so if that's okay with you uh Jorgos. yeah of course i will stay i love talking about it. okay excellent so uh costas please go ahead hello uh hey. can you hear me yeah yeah Th thank you this was very stimulating uh very interesting um, I'm wondering whether we can approach the problem of fighting the progenitors and the evolution of the systems through binary population synthesis techniques. Now, I suppose there are two problems. First, you need to be able to model the supernova behavior, uh, the explosion behavior, having given specific configuration and masses or whatever. And then there is another issue. In order to compare with the observations, you need a complete sample. And the oh. way that supernova are observed is, I don't know, very, uh, very weird. So maybe with LSST or whatever, maybe we can do this. So how far away are we from Ernie. this point? So when I finish this object, my plan is to you look all ZDF one A's and find the super standard. Uh, the reason is that it's important is uh, we don't know the actual rate. Of the observed rate, let's say, right? Because if we know the observed rate, then I don't know if you, but if anyone can do the binary synthesis and all of this crazy stuff, then we can compare and we're done. But because we don't know the rate, which is surprising, because these are bright and we would expect to find more of them, but we don't. Of course, as you said, you need a complete sample. And uh, I think my impression is that ZTF is complete up to a certain redshift. And I believe that, uh, and of course, sorry, um, when you calculate a rate, it's not just measuring how many supernova in, in, you know, I found 10 out of 100. It's not that simple, right? Because you need to take into account of the efficiency of the completeness and all of this. And uh, hopefully it's my plan to, to do this. Uh, I mainly showed you guys this, which I, again, I think it's amazing. I don't, may, may, many people, maybe people don't think about it, but for me, it's incredible uh, because it was a very good object and it just happened. And normally I wouldn't uh, do anything with it if it was just a normal Super Chandra, but uh, because of the bump, it's very interesting. Uh, but yeah, the, the, my plan after that is to, to, do, a, to do a statistical study within ZDF. Uh, of course, LSST, as you said, it's, uh, it, it will be even better because we'll go deeper. And as you go deeper, you increase the volume of the universe that you find. So we will find more as we increase the volume. Uh, but the problem with LSST is that uh, there will be a million triggers every night. And how you find this? You need spectra. We, we don't have time. Uh, but we will figure it out. But uh, I think with ZTF, we will be able to put a, at least a, a, a limit on the rate, let's say this. And then um, theory, theorists with uh, binary populations can just go with it and we'll figure it out, I think. Thank you. I, I think that uh, even without spectra, uh, at some point, I mean, you have some, let's say, uh, properties like luminosity, how the evolution of the light curve, if there are statistical differences there with huge samples, yeah. if the selection function for LSST is going to be behave well, maybe still things can be done and using possibly all different types of supernova because yeah, exactly. you, cannot, exactly. you cannot lose data here and there. Exactly. The, the plan is, uh, at least for ZTF, uh, it basically because you will not have spectra for everything, uh, you you have the light curves, but you have a big unknown, which is the extinction in the host, right? So you cannot get the absolute luminosity unless it is far away from the host or something like this. So I think what we should do is use ZDF, understand the phenomenon, how the light curves evolve, use the spectra, and do a, a train, do a training with a neural networks, whatever. How does a, one, a super chandra look like and how it's different from a 1A, and then use this for uh, all the other surveys uh, to, to pick them out, basically. Uh, because you can imagine that 
as the red shift increases, then you need to apply K corrections. Basically, G band is not the observed G band is not the rest and all of this. So you may see secondary maxima in R band with they shouldn't be there, but it, you know, whatever happens. It basically, photometry is just uh, bad spectroscopy, right? It's just low resolution spectroscopy, that's photometry. Everything spectrum is truth, right? Everything is in the spectrum. Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully ZDF will, I will repeat this, hopefully ZDF will give us a first step towards a rate on these objects. And by the way, the plan is for, for all of them, right? So we will have, we will try to put the rates on the one ACSM, also on uh, calcium reads if we find them, that one AX, which is other subtypes equally interested, uh, but a little bit rare, rarer because they're fainter, basically. Uh, we'll figure it out. Thank you. Cheers. So what I get from this uh, discussion is that uh, we actually don't yet know the delay time distribution for the Super Chandra Sekar mass ah. uh, events, right? Mate, we have like seven. <laughs> we okay, know. yeah. Like, but do the, do the seven, like uh, they they all have similar host properties? Like do they know. all occur? Yeah, well done, you are, you are going there. Uh, so there seems to be a preference for the host galaxies. Uh, one is that they are in small galaxies with high star formation. Uh, so they might be associated with like a young um, populations or yeah okay but but also uh, no not exactly because uh, sometimes they happen in remote in remote uh, locations of a galaxy mm -hmm. where you have all the populations so it is a little tricky uh, because uh, there's no selection biases and uh, also you don't know I mean, it could be far away from the host, but you but there may be a, a pocket of star formation there if you just don't see it, right? So it's not super clear, uh, but I would I would argue that um, that. that no, I, I will not argue anything. No, I will not say. <laughs> okay, I, mean, uh, I, I have my opinion, obviously, but uh, mm -hmm. and my opinion is a. Uh, is that I think these are mergers and not okay. Not so on, on that topic, actually, I have a couple of questions. Um, so if you actually, I think, can you go back to the previous slides? I, I think it was number thirty-four. So the one that you were showing the the light curve of this two thousand twenty um, with the bump. ESM event. Oh, uh, this one yeah. and this, yeah. Sorry, thirty. No, 34 maybe? Uh, yeah, so the one with the, with the bump. Uh, so do I understand correctly that, uh, well, first of all, I have a, a more general question. So if you have a, like, a, let's say a CO white dwarf accreting from a helium white dwarf, is that a double degenerate uh, mode uh, scenario or a single degenerate model? I, I, let's not stick with like it is what it is uh, but uh, okay uh, so so in the case where you have a merger I guess you would expect a, a lot of uh, uh, iron or um, iron line uh, uh, iron peak elements to be produced near the surface right so wouldn't that also make the light curve a little bit redder at the, at the, at the start. So mm -hmm. is this the opposite of what you see? Isn't this the opposite of what you see here? So uh, yes, but, but I would say no, uh, because the merger is also an effect of line of sight. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine- But then you have the bump, right? Uh... The bump is like one day. Okay, so is there, days. okay, I see. Um... So yeah, you're correct. Uh, when you have iron in uh, in the outer uh, regions of the ejecta, uh, you have a lot of lines which they um, they are in rest in the UV. Right? It is a line blanketing, right? So that's why generally we don't see. Right? Uh, sorry, generally UV uh, uh, type one A UV are faint because they are. Yeah. So the so basically the 
naively, I would think that you would expect something like the 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 green. Uh... Yeah. So this is this is eleven fe, right? So since we don't feet, see, yeah. and we see, you know, the color this, then this blue color is not from the from the ejecta. It's not from iron. It should be an external power source, which is blue, that contributes. Okay. And this I is see. basically the interaction. This is what we think. It's the interaction. Mm -hmm. So on that topic again, um, I was wondering if there are any alternatives way to exp uh, ways to explain the bump, for instance. I mean, yeah, uh, like something if you have a, the, the ejecta colliding with uh, so this is with yeah. a companion. Yeah, this is what uh, we argued for this. So um, here is the color of the supernova. This is the bump. The blue is the collision. Uh, which we prefer. The yellow here, gold or whatever, this is the surface nickel. So basically the idea behind this is that a bump can be produced not as an external power source of the interaction, but it's just a nickel, which generally it's produced in the center of the, of the white war. It is just mixed outwards, or, the, or there is a blob of nickel that goes outwards so it goes close to the surface, it decays. So the extra light that you see, it's just extra nickel that just uh, escaped the center of the white bar and went outwards. Uh, and the, the pink one, which does not work, uh, is the, the double detonation, which is a, an excellent, excellent uh, progenitor system um, scenario, uh, scenario, but this does not work for this. Uh, which is basically helium, right? So what you say before, I don't remember who asked, the big problem with a single degenerate is that uh, it's extremely difficult to ignite uh, hydrogen. Uh, it just that doesn't happen. Uh, and people have come around it by saying that, okay, maybe it's not hydrogen that ignites, but it's helium, helium is much easier. And this started the whole idea about the double detonation, which basically you have a white dwarf, you have a star, could be helium white dwarf, could be helium star, it provides the helium, the helium stays on the, on the surface, the detonation starts at the surface where the helium is accreted in a hotspot or something like this. And then the, the wave goes to the center, hits the center, second detonation, boom, and we fix the problem. Um, but not for the case of this, because this, the bump should be very red and we don't see it. Mm -hmm. That's all about this. But again, the problem with this is that uh, with a collision, you expect hydrogen and we don't see it. And in my paper- Well, not if the, not if the companion is a helium white dwarf, for instance. Um... Yeah, but the helium white dwarf is, uh, I'm not sure how, how, you can, how you can have this. This bump is uh, five days long. Mm -hmm. The time scale. So it's uh that would then you would need a very large uh, companion to large to part. make this work. I see. Okay. In the paper we we calculate what is the this. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. And I guess you don't have any polarimetry for this. Maybe uh, if, I had, if we had polarimetry at minus uh, fifteen days, we would solve all the problems. Of five one eight. But uh, it's a difficult observation. You know that. Uh, it needs to be bright, it needs to be nearby, uh, we don't have, but uh, to tell you the truth, this was the referee, the referee told me something about this. Uh, I would argue that it's not a huge deal because uh, eventually, even if it is asymmetric, the merger, because it produces an asymmetric uh, system, Eventually, as the ejecta expand and collide, after a few days, they will settle in a more spherical geometry, probably. So, okay, if we had the polarimetry at hours after explosion, then sure, we will constrain. Uh, but I don't think that because we, we see symmetries at peak, this tells us anything about 20 days before peak, about the symmetry or asymmetry uh, at that very early times. But that's me. So. 
Okay, that makes sense. Uh, thanks a lot. Sí. Um, other questions? Just pick up. It's uh, very few people still here. Okay, so if not, uh, I guess we can end the talk here. So thank you. Thanks again, Yorgos, uh, for, uh, thanks, for this very thanks interesting for, uh, talk. Thanks for the opportunity. Sorry for uh, to, to taking some more time. Um, no, no, no. That was uh, that was uh, you were on time. Uh, that was that was very good. Yes. And uh, hopefully next time we can repeat it in in person. So just uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, uh, way, it was very nice that I saw some. I see some friends, uh, Manos and Panos. Uh, I know them. Uh, the Greek astronomers know each other, especially in the, <laughs> Indeed. In, in Indeed. the, the transient. So, yeah, it was great. And, and Alex, of course. Alex. So I will stop sharing. OK, so I guess we can end the call here. And uh, thanks again. And uh, let's uh, stay in touch. Uh, I, will, I, I would really like to hear about your plans on the, for the telescope array. And all of these. Yeah, yeah. So amazing. maybe, yeah, you know, we, we can arrange a different uh, yeah. another call. Yeah, 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 uh, certainly. So, and again, thanks a lot, everyone. Everyone, please. Thank you. Okay. So bye, everyone. Bye bye.